Our next speaker spent 39 years working in the police, mostly as a detective. In 2005, together with Karen McCluskey, they established the Violence Reduction Unit, and this gentleman has been speaking about primary prevention and ACEs for 12 years. This morning, he told me that he feels that there is a sense of change in the air. So let's find out why he thinks that today. Ladies and gentlemen, John Carnican. Morning. <laughs> you see, sometimes it's really lonely talking about this. And you think there's nobody else interested. Nobody else is connected. There's thousands of us. So there's no excuse after today. Um, I've only got 20 minutes, so you need to tune in. <laughs> and if I talk too quick, I'll, I'll try and slow down. Welcome if you, to, to Glasgow, one of the safest cities in the world. That was Karen in the education department that did that. Had nothing to do with me. Um, I'm, I'm going to start off with a question this morning. I hope you don't mind. It's just to, there's, I, and I, hope, I won't be able to see everybody. It's a multiple choice question. And there's only two choices. So come on. Um, I want you to put your hand up if you're not a son or a daughter. Cool. <laughs> you know... I've been speaking to audiences about ACEs and, and, and a range of other things as well, because violence is my thing, uh, um, all over the place. And it turns out I'm always speaking to humans. <laughs> always. But it seems that the people who come in the door are social workers and doctors and dentists and nurses and cops and stuff, and they actually leave all that other stuff outside. So I'm going to speak a wee bit about that. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm not a teacher. I'm not a social worker. I'm not a civil servant. I'm not an academic. That will become apparent to you as this goes on. Um, I'm human. I'm disruptive. And I'm a grandfather. Never underestimate grandfathers. <laughs> you see, what, what seems to have happened over the years, and, and Pauline spoke a bit about it there, is we've become in the thrall of systems, particularly business models, where the only value frame is money. And so we, we tend just to think about the systems. This morning, for instance, there was a, at the start of the day, there was a perfect system in place to have you all get in here at the right time. <laughs> but we had 2,000 human involved, and so it gets messy. And we need to be comfortable with that. Systems don't like things that don't actually conform. ACs, for instance, Systems will start to speak about ACEs as a score, and it will become a matrix which will dictate where the threshold is for services. You need to reign against that. The score is there. <laughs> We've only got 20 minutes. Don't waste any time on that stuff. <laughs> we need to understand that that's really important. It's really important that we understand what these are. ACEs are so we can discuss trauma. That's what they're about. It's so that we can make children's lives better today than they are yesterday and better for tomorrow. So that's important. But we, we're into that system stuff. That's what we do. And you see, the thing is, and it, it was Suzanne Zedek that told me about this and, and others as well, we're born connected and we stay connected. No mum ever lifts her newborn baby and says, I'm going to make your life hell. Nobody. They don't. But sometimes love's not just enough. There's other things impact around us that we need to take account of. That context. When I get to Pullman Prison, the young guys who are there, if you ask them what they want for their children, and most of the young men in there are fathers, they don't want the same for their children as themselves. And yet, that seems to elude us, and we forget about that. Because this idea that we're born connected, it's biological. We're working against it otherwise. I mean, when I watch, do you watch Long Lost Families? Oh. I mean, I'm a big detective from Glasgow investigating murders, weeping like a child in front of this thing. <laughs> How does that happen? When Andy Murray loses at Wimbledon and he's crying, I've got this terrible one. And I think, he's getting paid £750,000 for coming second. <laughs> I don't even like tennis. Why am I crying? 
because we're born connected. We can't help ourselves. My wife, for instance, Anita, we've been married for 44 years. Um, to get to each other uh, for 44 years. No, no, I don't. You'll only encourage her. You'll only encourage her. <laughs> She's got a particular affinity for George Clooney. I don't know how that happens. We even drink his coffee. <laughs> which is not that fabulous, I have to tell you. So, we need to try and get away from that. And you wonder why it is. I mean, if you look at job descriptions, all of these things will be in the job description you have. And loads of other stuff. You'll have loads of other things. Always there. Why do we have those in our job descriptions? Compassion, you know, is the only, one of the few words that's mentioned consistently in every religious textbook across every religion in the world. Compassion. Because it's a human thing. It's there. And maybe we'll get to the stage where we'll actually recruit people and value their humanity as much as we value their CPD or their BSc or their MA or their MBCHB or their whatever. And that would be good. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that those skills are not important. I mean, if I get wheeled up at an A&E, I want somebody who knows what they're doing. I just don't want a cuddle, you know? So, so let's be clear about that. But what seems to have happened is we've lost the balance in that. And, and Pauline mentioned that notion before. When you, when you talk about cuddling a chick, that's unprofessional. We actually talk about it being unprofessional. That's absurd. A big person helping a little person. How can that be, how can that be unprofessional? So we need, to, we need to challenge that, and it will be really difficult. So violence is my thing. Well, violence prevention is my thing, to be perfectly honest. Um, you'll be reassured to know. Um, although we still have violence on the tactical options menu, it's still there. Because, you see, we, we don't learn how to be violent. We learn how not to be violent. So in those early years, and the most important four years of a child's life is up to age three, in those early years... We learn to communicate, to negotiate, to compromise. We learn problem solving. We learn compassion and empathy because it's modeled around us. We learn how to establish and maintain relationships. It's why we're top of the food chain. That's what we do. And so if a, if a child's born into an environment where their caregivers can't do that for a range of reasons, then they, they, they don't learn to be violent, but they don't learn these other coping strategies that allow them to deal with the world. They bump into the world. They don't leave home and say, I'm going to be violent and aggressive today. That's the way they are. And violence is a man thing. Sorry. Um, there are some violent women, but it's fundamentally a man thing. And if we don't fix violence against women, we will never fix violence, ever. So we need to start there. That nexus, that nexus is hugely important because it's, it's in the home and it's family. So when Karen and I started doing this, Karen McCluskey and I set up the VRU. Karen's like me except smarter and wears fabulous shoes. <laughs> she thinks there's not enough leopard skin in the world. And she's doing her bit to redress that. When we set this up, we, we started just to follow the evidence. Well, how will we? So we started speaking, first of all, about public health because it was a health issue, not a crime issue. And that gave us a whole new language. We able to talk about prevention and primary prevention, secondary prevention, tertiary prevention. I even know what these things are now. I mean, and it's only because of that I know what tertiary education is, because I was never involved in it. So we started doing that, and when we discovered primary prevention in the work of Vincent Felitti in Adverse Childhood Experiences, and spoke to Harry Burns about uh, Antonovsky's work and the sense of coherence and that understanding your world and making sense of your world. And I thought, obviously people don't know about this. Obviously, this is a secret. Because if we knew about this, We'd be doing things differently, surely. And as it turns out, how naive was I? We did know about it. And it seems that we're a wee bit stuck. We're just not quite sure how to get it over the line. In 2007, we invited Vincent Felitti to Tully Allen, to the Scottish Police College, where we ran a conference with the World Health Organization that Nicola Sturgeon opened as Health Minister, that Kenny McCaskill spoke at as Justice Minister, and here we are 11 years later, and we're still talking about the same thing. We're still here. So it does take time, and I'm getting a bit more patient now than perhaps I was before. Um, and it, so we started thinking about this quote from Machiavelli. It's really difficult to do. And I don't know if it's to do with vested interests. When, when sometimes I get asked to speak about gangs, um, and I always qualify when I'm asked. I said, what kind of gangs do you want me to speak about? Police, health, social work, education. 
or will we just speak about the territorial gangs that are in the east end or where in the east end of Glasgow? And that's usually what we want to speak about. But the, the fact of the matter, all of those other professional gangs are equally, if not more, corrosive because they're protective. And the thing that ACEs appeals for a whole range of reasons. ACEs mean we can start to understand better why we're stuck. Because ACEs is not about other people. ACEs is about us. ACEs is about everybody. It's not just about other people. And so the idea of, of thinking how we, how we got here, it, it, it starts to bring us a bit closer together. Carol Craig's book, for instance, you, you have a read at that, because that's that same thing, that realisation that somebody born in Bear's Den and a, a, a good life thinks back and thinks, well, hang about. And there are things there that are really important, and we should be thinking about that, because I think that's perhaps why we've got stuck in things, because there are really smart politicians there. I mean, John Smitty is really smart. So is Nicola Sturgeon and others. And if there was a liberty pool, it would have been pulled. If, if it could have been done, if the system could have fixed it, it would have done it. Because the system likes to do things for itself. And it would, have, it would have done it. And if it hasn't, we can only presume there's perhaps reasons for that. And sometimes there's that. We make things far too complicated at times. And there's no doubt, and I'm not, I'm not dissing the science, absolutely the opposite of that. But we get ourselves into the stage sometimes that we're terrified to do anything because you know those negative architects that are out there? You know the people, they, ha they have a problem for every solution. You know those? It's, I, I used to think it was a Scottish thing. You know the Calvin gene? You know that every, every silver lining does indeed have a black cloud. You know that one? <laughs> we thought it was that. We, we thought it might have been that. Um, where you'd say, we used to, we started to call them the abbots. Because you'd say, we're thinking of doing this. Ah, but I'm not sure that'll, you know, an <laughs> abbot, you know. And there was always an abbot. The thing is, systems like such order that they want everyone at the start line at the same time. They want to all step off at the same time, be at certain destinations at the same time. And can I tell you, I'm 65 now. Life's quite messy. That's the way it is. And as humans, that's how we cope with that. That's how we cope with today, just that making that decision and getting things sorted. So, the important thing is, we need to start where we are and do what we can. The idea about leadership, that's a system thing. That hierarchical, yeah, the leader's responsible for leading. Really? No, they're not. We're all leaders. We can all do things. We can all advance until apprehended. We can push the envelope and go a bit further. You don't need the, the, a reason to do the right thing. You certainly don't need a strategy for it. And we don't need huge big changes. I mean, we're at the stage now where on the news, have you noticed, they'll say, Barclays Bank have issued a warning. Their profits are down to two billion pounds. And I think, really? How did we get to that? A warning that they're only two billion? When we were doing the gang stuff, there was a, there was a woman from Radio 4 who came up to see us. Very nice lady. Um, Karen would normally have spoken to her because she's a Radio 4 woman, I'm not. Um, so we're sitting in my office and this very nice woman from Radio 4 said to me, John, I don't understand your accent. And I said, well, I actually live here, work here, and it's my office, so technically I don't have an accent. <laughs> and we took it from there. But what she had said was, we had said, look, the gang fighting, uh, uh, the violence has reduced by 85%, although there's still offending behavior ongoing. She said, hmm, 85%. So there's still 15%. I said, yeah. <laughs> Last month they were stabbing each other to death. This month they're getting drunk and falling down. That's a result. That's what it, I mean, we need to understand that. If you come into your work every day to fix this, you're going to go home at night incredibly disappointed and drinking lots of wine, I suspect. But our job's to make it better. That's what our job's to do. It's to do what we can individually. The only person you get control over is you. And we can actually make that difference. I love this guy. Tiananmen Square in the 80s. Now, the, a, couple of week, a couple of days before this, there had been a demonstration that had been put down. And your man sees the tanks rolling into the square. And he thinks, that's not right. What can I do about that? I know. I'll stand in front of the tank. So he did. Which was hugely brave. And as the tank tried to go around him, he just did that. And then he actually climbed on the tank and spoke to the human who was driving it. 
And what it did, it, it went viral. So the world got to know a bit more about what happened there. Now, there wasn't a strategy for that or a policy for that. There wasn't any operational orders for that. Certainly wasn't a bloody risk assessment, I would suggest. <laughs> but he just said, what can I do and I'm going to do it. And he just bloody did it. And we need to do that. Sometimes we need to stand in front of tanks. And I don't want to upset anybody, but just be aware, sometimes you might be the tank. So be aware of that, because we're not all right all the time. So you need to be prepared to change your mind. What I like most about him is he's got two bags of shopping. <laughs> That's really cool. I like him. I reckon his wife's in a flat somewhere saying, he left in an hour ago to go to the top. And he's not back yet. What the hell's that about? And he'll come back in with that fabulous excuse. I'm sorry, darling, but there were tanks in the square. You know? <laughs> I mean, even I wouldn't use that excuse. That's, that's no one that, that, that goes by. In hope, I see somebody sitting in the audience, uh, um, who, who'll not let me mention them, uh, Professor Phil Hanlon, who um, is a public health guy at Glasgow University. He's now retired. And Karen and I went to meet him, and he was incredibly patient with us um, because... Well, I'm not the brightest. So he was incredibly patient. And I, and I remember saying how frustrated I was getting about things now happening. And I don't know if Phil will remember this, but Phil said, well, well, you need to just relax about that because it's our turn. And that's what it is. It's our turn. Others have gone before us and others will follow us. But right now, it's our turn. So we need to start where we are and do what we can. And I'm going to read a poem for you. Um, I've been doing some work recently. I was asked to co-chair with, with Beth Ann Logan, who's an absolute star, um, the, the best place in the world group on the Independent Care Review. Because, you know, if you want to understand ACEs in real microcosm, look at our care system, where we take children from their families under the notion of protecting them or safeguarding them and we put them in a system and give them a service when actually what they needed was love. And we should have been with them in the family and kept the family together is what we should have done. So I came across this poem by Liz Lockhead, uh, Lockheed, who, who wrote it in 2012 for the children's panel to get people to join the children's panel. And it's called, um, Trouble is not my middle name. Trouble is not my middle name. It's not what I am. I was not born for this. Trouble is not a place, though I am in it deeper than the deepest wood, and I'd get out of it. Wouldn't I? If I could. Hope is what I do not have in hell, not without good help now. Could you listen, listen hard and well to what I cannot say except by what I do? And when you say I do it for badness, this much is true. I do it for badness done to me before any badness that I've done to you. Hard to unthank this, but you can help me. Maybe. Loosen all these knots and really listen. I cannot plainly tell you this, but if you care, then beyond all harm and hurt, real hope lies there. So that notion of hope, it's not a, it's not an airy-fairy notion. It's that, which I like from Havel, which is about, don't think about the outcome. If it seems like doing the right thing, it's that human stuff, you know, comforting a child who's distressed, that's the right thing to do. Why wouldn't you do that? Cheryl uh, Sandberg speaks about leaning in, and that's what we need to do. And for me, um, that's what awareness is about. Awareness, some people think, well, that's, that's a quite a weak verb, that, you know. We're not, I'm going to be aware of it. Well, what I'm saying to you is the awareness should arm you. Well, that's a bit martial. But it, it should, it should um, give you the confidence to do stuff and, and move on and lean into it. Because once, once you're aware, it's impossible not to change. And sometimes I get really frustrated and have done over the past um, while. Um, but I'm an old guy, I'm allowed to do that. I get frustrated sometimes when people think we need evidence to prove that you, you shouldn't be smacking kids. And I hate the word smacking. How do you need evidence to say that? That's absurd. How do you need evidence to say in science to say that a, a, a baby who's born to a mum who's really struggling with a violent partner and she's maybe an alcoholic, addiction problems, living in poverty. How can you, how do you need science to tell you you should be helping that way? And it's just absurd. And so, if that's what you need, then that's fine. That's where we are. But we need to go on all fronts with us. 
We need to go on all fronts. It's been a while, and, and um, it'll take time. There's no doubt about that. But remember, it's our turn. Change will begin at an individual level. It'll begin with you. Don't accept, expect the system to change. It's like the Borg. It'll adapt what you're saying, and it'll absorb it, and it'll shift it and shape it, and it'll say, oh, yes, we're already doing that. I've met that system before. And they're not. Call it out. So it changes from the inside out, and it changes from the bottom up. We still need the systems. We still need policy. We still need politicians and leaders. But hey, don't wait. You've no need to wait. Advance until apprehended. That's what you need to do. That's Karen saying. It'll get you into trouble. But it's got us into lots of trouble. But ask for forgiveness after it's done. So when you leave here, I'll tweet the pictures of everybody. Because as you go forward with this, there'll be days where you'll be sitting on your own and you'll think, this is, oh, this is really hard. And I'll tweet this picture. And you'll see there's thousands of you. The IRA used to say, and I, as a police officer, I'm not keen to quote the IRA, but hey. Um, <laughs> if it suits the purpose. And they would say, you only see me. You don't see behind me. Thousands of us. And that's what the ACES movement's got to be about in Scotland. It has to be about thousands of us. Talking about it to our friends, to our colleagues. Because you're here not just with professionals. You're here as humans. Your whole self's in the room. So when you leave here, take your whole self with you. And you know that, the other thing I learned from Phil Hanlon, first of all, do no harm. Do no harm. We'll make it better for Scotland's kids. And we will be ace aware. You'll be surprised at the difference it'll make. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks very much for your time.